on the digital infrastructure. So we have shifted the time from 2 o'clock to 2.20. So we will be running this program from 2 o'clock to 4.05. I am Jonathan Salvacion, project leader of ERDT Mapua University. And I am glad to welcome our speakers, moderator, and webinar participants. So without much ado, I'll uh, introduce, the, introduce them to you now. Our session moderator is Dr. Orben Llantos. Dr. Orben Llantos spent 11 years and counting, developing a social learning management system called My.Escuela, developed and supported by the Department of Education, Iligan City, with Tambo Central School as the eager user. The SLMS generated copyright research and extension projects through government funding by MSU IIT and the USD. Uh, it recently supported the conduct of synchronous classes during this time of the pandemic. A software developer by heart, Dr. Llanto's goal is to continually develop MyDotSquela and contribute to knowledge concerning the learning the interactions that add to student learning. Our first uh, topic will be the national broad broadband plan, and it will be brought to you by Director Antonio Edward E. Padre, OIC Director of DICT. Um, Director Antonio Edward E. Padre is currently the OIC Director of the Government Digital Transformation Bureau of the Department of Information and Communications Technology, or DICT. Director Padre earned his bachelor's degree in electronics communications engineering from St. Louis University and his master's in business administration from the International Academy of Management and Economics. As the OIC director of the Government Digital Transformation Bureau and concurrent project director of the National Government Portal, he leads development and operations of the Vaccine Information Management System and is a member of the Technical Evaluation Committee for the 2022 National and Local Automated Elections, Automated Elections Project. The second topic today is uh, about the role of private investments and telco players in the development of the country's digital infrastructure. And one speaker on this topic is Mr. Vince Temponko, a name that brings uh, several memories from the good old times. Mr. Vince Temponko leads the national acquisition and management of site properties and rights of way for Globe's network facilities as the company's vice president for site acquisition and management. He also develops strategic partnerships with key stakeholders, including government units, and finds in a innovative and non-traditional ways of overcoming, overcoming challenges in the site, site acquisition process. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Temponko earned his bachelor's degree in electronics and communications engineering from the University of the Philippines. The second speaker on the same topic is Attorney Roy D. Ivai, VP and Heads of Regulatory Affairs, Smart Communications. Attorney Ivai is concurrently the Vice President for Regulatory Affairs, I, I think I mentioned that already. He is also the Vice President and Director of the Philippine Chamber of Telecommunications Operators or PCTO. Attorney Ibai is the founder of the Information Systems Security Society of the Philippines, IEEESP, and a member of the National Data Privacy Council. He obtained his bachelor's degree in economics from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and his Juris Doctor degree from the Ateneo de Manila University. And the last topic, opportunities and challenges in the physical, in the application of Internet of Things 
in the Philippines will be brought to us by Dr. Romel D. Gomez. Dr. Romel Gomez is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Maryland. He currently serves as the associate chair for undergraduate education. He teaches engineering, sorry, teaches engineering design, circuits, microelectronics, electromagnetics, quantum theory, and magnetic technology at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Dr. Gomez is also a researcher in the broad areas of magnetism and biosensing. He has co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications, several book chapters, a book, and holds three U.S. patents. And with those introductions, I would now like to give the floor to Dr. Llantos, session moderator. Take it away, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Janeta, for that uh, introduction. So this will be the backgrounder of our session for this afternoon. And this will be the, uh, the starting point where our uh, panel will discuss and present their ideas upon this one. So the Philippines ranked 57 out of 63 countries in the 2020 World Competitiveness Digital Ranking. That was published by the Institute for Management Development, a Switzerland-based independent academic institution. In the same report, the country ranked 10th globally in terms of highest investments in telecommunications. IMD posets that sustaining increased investments in physical and digital infrastructure is a key component in ensuring the digital competitiveness of a country. Compared to its June 2020 standing, the country's fixed broadband ranking rose from 103rd to 63rd and its mobile internet ranking from 110th to 72nd in UCLA's July 2021 Global Speed Test Index. The National Broadband Plan was rolled out to accelerate the deployment of fiber optic cables and wireless technologies and improve the overall speed and affordability of the internet all over the country. The NBP is structured into six components, national fiber optic cable or FOC backbone, cable landing stations, accelerated tower build, accelerated fiber build, satellite overlay, and broadband delivery management service. The Department of Information and Communications Technology, or the ICT, has earmarked 13.4 billion for the NBP in 2021. Despite the growing interest in IoT in the Philippines, our IT infrastructure is mostly composed of legacy hardware and software systems, thus considered a challenge that could limit the coverage of IoT implementation in the country. Thank you, Dr. Corvin. And also, Sir Jonathan. Yes, sir. May I request the, the host secretariat to help me run the short presentation? Yes, sir. We'll open it Thank now. You. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon to all participants also with uh, the panelists uh, it is uh, our privilege to share with you the ICT's uh, digital infrastructure plan. This is a five-year development plan that was uh, presented uh, last week with the House of Representatives. And uh, we are also been invited to share the, the same program to the Senate of the Philippines. Um, as mentioned by our moderator, uh, this is uh, 
for the national and the local government units. So the DICT, uh, as we work for the new normal and prepare the government uh, frontline services in the new normal, uh, came up with the CHIP framework. This is uh, somewhat patterned with the United Nations. Uh, we have uh, projects aligned with CONNECT, uh, like infrastructure, ICT infrastructure, then harness is to uh, upgrade or upscale and uh, reskill uh, government workers or public servants on ICT, new, newer ICT knowledge. And we have to innovate our frontline services to the public, especially for the, the Filipinos. So, uh, we are working to upgrade our government portal for uh, in support to the ease of doing business uh, being uh, implemented with the leadership of the entire tape authority and then also uh, to protect everyone who will be using our ICT services and uh, the infrastructure related to it. The ICT is also uh, leveraging on cyber security programs to uh, propose, uh, promote secure, uh, the, the sense of security of uh, users. Next slide, please. So for the connect uh, part of our framework, uh, uh, we are working for, with, we are working on the national broadband program. Uh, a fiber optic uh, intensive infrastructure that will connect all national government agencies. And by 2022, uh, as, an, uh, as an, an effect of the Mandana's uh, principle, uh, we will be working with the local government units in so far as ICT development in the local level. Uh, the Connect framework uh, works on uh, first uh, fiber optics, where fiber optic is uh, really expense, it's expensive to implement and we go for IP-based uh, rate transmission systems. And in areas where both are not possible, uh, we are looking at the uh, satellite technology to reach uh, the power plant areas, especially the geographically isolated and this advantage areas for GDA. Next slide, please. For the harness program, uh, it has been the, the, the aim or the goal of the ICT to help the industry, ICT industry in particular, to bring the jobs on the countryside. Right now, it's uh, around 70% of the direct jobs are in the national capital regions and other mega cities such as Cebu City, Davao City, Bacolod City, and uh, Mabalakat City or specifically Clarkfield, Pampanga, among, uh, to name a few. But toward the end of, uh, uh, toward, toward 2030, we are looking at uh, repositioning other cities that uh, have the potential to, to host uh, BPO locators in their, in their respective areas of jurisdiction. Right now we have 25 cities working with us to prepare their uh, facilities and services uh, for the appreciation of ITBPM industry in the global stage. Uh, not only infrastructure wise, but uh, the ICT is also working with the National ICT Confederation of the Philippines, the IBPAP, and uh, the Philippine Software Association of the Philippines, the Games Development Association of the Philippines, and the Animation Council of the Philippines, and also the uh, Healthcare Management Association of the Philippines in uh, rolling out specialized training courses in the countryside, in speci specifically for the seven cities. Out of the 25 cities that we are looking for toward 2025, 
uh, for them to prepare their infrastructure services and uh, uh, professionals to to be evaluated by global IT BPM companies. Next slide, please. For the Innovate, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, working to uh, migrate the government portal, the gov.ph portal, to a more conducive and uh, in tune with the technologies nowadays. As uh, this government portal is just an umbrella portal for all the websites uh, developed it by each of the national government agencies. We're looking at, uh, due to the effect of the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, for the next few months to issue a policy guidelines for national government agencies to the uplift their respective websites toward uh, transactional and uh, with the e payment portal because uh, around only only around 10% of the government websites are with the e e e electronic port, uh, payment uh, connectivity so to, to espouse a no contact policy as the government's working on that regard, uh, we, the ICT wishes to guide or help technically this in, in the national government agencies uh, in establishing transactional and transactional fully transactional websites with e-payment services as well. Uh, next slide, please. For the the, the protect uh, component of the chief framework, uh, the ICT has been working with all concerned agencies in the national government, like uh, the, the Department of Justice, the National Bureau of Investigations and uh, Cyber Crime Division, and the Nas Philippine National Police uh, Anti-Cyber Crime Group, as well as the National Security Council for the establishment of a profound cybersecurity infrastructure. Uh, we've, we've set up already the National Computer Emergency Response Team the, that uh, handles uh, computer-related uh, challenges, as well as we, we are working with uh, also the private sector in so far as uh, the vulnerability and uh, vulnerability and penetration test uh, procedures. Uh, these are all on uh, uh, aimed at uh, incorporating in global standards, so that uh, uh, with the with the, with that global stamp, uh, we will be uh, treated globally as uh, cyber security aware. Uh, country. Uh, in, is, uh, in addition to that, you are rolling out the public national key infrastructure, uh, which is more, uh, more popularly known as digital signature or the, the offering of digital certificates to initially for government uh, employees, uh, officers and uh, select employees. But toward the, in preparation for the national and local elections in 2022, we will be uh, issuing uh, digital certificates to around eight, uh, 80,000, I think 80,000 more or less, um, public school teachers who will be serving as uh, uh, election officers. Uh, however, uh, to tell uh, for the information of the public, we, we, we are procuring around uh, 800,000 digital certificate accounts to augment our existing infrastructure at the moment. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the current state, uh, everyone knows, uh, especially during the pandemic, uh, has been uh, uh, challenging 
Uh, in so far as internet services and connectivity is concerned, and we salute all the, the major telcos as well as the ISPs and the other government agencies for sharing us to uh, move the implementation of uh, needed infrastructure programs uh, much faster than ever. Uh, before the pandemic or pre-pandemic uh, period, uh, would say would state that uh, the challenge of the telcos and the ISPs would uh, be challenging in so far as permitting is concerned. However, we were able to improve that uh, since uh, March of 2020 or June of 2020 uh, with the issue ones of related. Uh, Memor joint memorandum circulars, circulars to appease the permitting requirements. Uh, and so far as our uh, DICT's records are concerned, we, uh, we have uh, a spare report from the telcos. Uh, local government units have already issued around 7,000 permits for the construction of a tower uh, or the passive telecommunications tower infrastructure. Aside from that, uh, the ICT has rolled out uh, a common tower policy where several, uh, around 32 companies have signified their intentions and uh, have been given a uh, go signal to work with the uh, telcos for the implementation of uh, passive telecommunications towers infrastructure or to where the Telcos need those infrastructure. Um, with the leadership of the Antiretic Authority, we were able to come up with uh, the updating of uh, existing uh, Department of Orders of DPWH, uh, and so far as uh, fiber cable laying out on major, major thoroughfares is concerned, and also the installation of uh, telecommunications posts along major thoroughfares. Uh, we are uh, expecting the, the Department of Public Works and Highways to issue the updated uh, department orders to ease up the, the clearances of telcos in so far as uh, implementing this fiber is concerned. Uh, next slide, please. So next slide, please. So these are the infrastructure programs that the ICT is rolling out. Uh, of course, the National Broadband Plan, uh, pre Wi-Fi will be handled uh, next year by the local government units. And we are working also on uh, establishment of uh, government data centers. Uh, we have uh, two existing data centers now. One is hosted or owned by the Department of ICT and the other one is leased by, uh, leased on a, uh, with a private uh, provider. And uh, in support of the national ID system, uh, we are leasing two uh, data, center, data centers uh, hosted by, of course, the Philippine Long Distance Telephone Company. Uh, the one that's being, the second uh, data center that we have is being hosted by uh, the Globe Telecoms uh, Incorporated. And uh, we will be making live by next year, first quarter or second, towards second quarter of next year, 2022, the third government data center of the DICT. And uh, for the medium term, we will be uh, leasing uh, data center spaces in Cebu City and Davao City, and most probably uh, a, a DR data center somewhere in the Visayas region. Uh, uh, we are also working with the Baguio City for the hosting of uh, the data center that will host the requirements of the northern, northern Lusun area. Uh, for the national broadband plan, we will be launching the redundancy route on September 27, one for the national, national capital region, another one in Cebu City, and another one in Davao City. Uh, after that, we will be uh, working with our contractors to, to roll out the first 100 gigabits uh, internet connectivity uh, by next year uh, for the National Broadband Plan Phase 1 from Baler Aurora to 
uh, San Fernando City uh, to our cable landing stations toward National Capital Region here and then up north, Lawag City. Uh, they will be all national government agencies and uh, local government units along that particular, within that particular area will be uh, given 100 gigs of internet. Uh, of course, they will uh, share not, not uh, 100 gig per agency. Uh, by next year, we'll be uh, procuring the next 200 gigs uh, because our, our work, uh, Facebook has shared with us uh, 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 one uh, two terabit uh, pipe from uh, Los Angeles, California, and it has connected the, uh, it has terminated the submarine cable in our cable landing facility in Valero. Uh, that's uh, that's a pipe, and uh, we are acquiring the, the internet bandwidth that will be used by the the whole of government. So one fourth of that two two giga two terabits will be used by BCDA as part of our uh, existing agreement with uh, the Basis Convention Development Authority. Oh, okay. As I mentioned earlier, by 2022, the Mandanas principle will take effect and uh, uh, the local government uh, units will be taking the lead in support as the local development and is concerned and that would include the ICT development. However, we are, the ICT is working already as of now, with several uh, provincial and local government units for the provincial and local government infrastructure groups. Uh, this is for the, the government. Uh, so I hope, uh, uh, and it's clear with the, the telcos and the ISPs that we will not be offering commercial grade service to subscribe. We will not be offering subscription. Uh, we'll just be offering internet services to our to the government so we have uh, from as far as Baguio city and up north to Neg uh, negros the provincial government of negros occidental in in, in uh, the visayas to for for the provincial broadband network infrastructure uh, we have around uh, 15 regional centers that are already equipped with government networks that offer efficient and uh, reliable internet services. Of course, the internet is being sourced out by private providers. Uh, some of them will be participate are members of the panel, uh, offering at least one gig per regional government network. Uh, we are about to procure the next three government networks for Batangas City, uh, Cagayan de Oro Regional Center. Uh, for Batangas, that would be the provincial government network. And for the biggest one is Davao City with uh, around uh, 160 national and local government uh, offices to be provided with initially with uh, internet services. Okay, uh, the phase two of the national broadband plan will be procured by the first quarter of next year that will uh, uh, provide the uh, fiber optic connectivity and uh, inter IP grade radio connectivity from the national capital region to Mimaropa uh, with the, the first provin uh, the provincial government network in Boa Marindao. Uh, we are working with other providers for the, the Bicol region, uh, Eastern Visayas and Northeastern Mindanao region. So, NBP phase as well as the other phases. The phase, uh, the NBP is all uh, around the total of those seven phases throughout towards 2025. Um, for the pre-Wi-Fi program, uh, the regional loops and the provincial loops and as well as the local uh, level loops will be the foremost for priority uh, concern. Uh, technical uh, 
assistance will be handled by the free Wi-Fi project management team to the local government unit. Uh, I'm, I'm not free, privy of the guidelines in so far as the Bandana's principle is concerned, but uh, we were told that the Department of uh, Finance and the Department of Interior and local government units are jointly crafting the guidelines that will be uh, issued soon. Next slide, please. Uh, this is this uh, showing to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are the two landing cable landing stations uh, where the international internet will be terminated one in uh, aurora province and the other one in la union uh, the one in la union is open to open at the moment because of the geo world geopolitical uh, considerations uh, facebook uh, did not proceed with the termination of the cable landing station at the western uh, side toward Hong Kong, China. However, there are several uh, uh, companies, global companies that have been uh, discussing with the ICT in so far as using the cable landing facility to uh, take a uh, work around toward Taiwan or toward uh, Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, all in all, we'll be uh, hopefully offering the whole of government uh, 1.75 terabits of internet bandwidth. Next slide, please. So as in, in the rolling out of the MVP, we've uh, entered into an MOU with the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines for the use of its uh, dark fiber. Uh, there are still uh, available cores in that uh, fiber that can be used for the Dalup government. Uh, to, to lay a fears, uh, so and answer the fears of the, the public in so far as uh, the cyber security of this facility is concerned, the ICT will be using the uh, available, uh, two of the available cores with separate uh, telecommunication center. Uh, the, the course that will be used for the national broadband plan will not be terminated under the control of the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines. It will be terminated on a telecom cent shelter that will be installed in all the major uh, and nodes of uh, the NGCT fiber. And the ICT or its uh, managed service provider will be managing those uh, telecom shelter uh, separate from the NGCT operations. Next slide, please. So here, this is the, these are the priority or focus areas of the MVP uh, project management office, uh, the implementation of the fiber backbone, uh, network management, uh, the acquisition and the operation and maintenance of the, the internet from Facebook ads or other uh, global providers. Of course, the maintenance of cable landing stations, the two one. Uh, this uh, item number five is uh, a complementary to the private uh, telcos uh, program of tower infrastructure deployment. Uh, we understand or everyone understands that uh, the private sector cannot cover the whole archipelago of 7,464. 142, if I, if I get it right, islands. There will always be missionary areas or the GIDA, uh, or geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas where uh, infrastructure deployment will be challenging on a part of the, the private telcos. Thus, the ICT plans to roll out infrastructure, either towers, or item number six, satellite networks to provide internet connectivity to this uh, uh, GIDA. 
um, uh, I'm not, I cannot say precisely if the ICT will procure towers or enter into agreement with common tower policy uh, providers to install uh, or to put up uh, tower structures in those areas, missionary areas. Uh, it's not yet, uh, we are on the process of evaluating if the ICT can manage to procure satellite facility or uh, at least uh, existing private uh, satellite service uh, services. It's uh, any, any of which will be fully evaluated and with the, the guidance of the general public as well as the, our private uh, telco partners. Next slide, please. So for this one, uh, for the pre-Wi-Fi, these are the priorities, as I mentioned earlier. This, this four priori uh, these three priorities will be uh, collaborated with uh, uh, extensively with the local government units, except for the regional rings where the ICT will uh, manage the rollout and uh, most probably the operation and maintenance. The provincial and broadband network will be fully or extensively discussed and collaborated with the provincial and local government units. As mandated by RA 10929, we will be rolling out free Wi Fi in public places. And, the, and that would include a separate a pro, a sub project for SUCs. But all of this will be collaborated with the respective or concerned local government units. Next slide, please. Uh, for the digital infrastructure, uh, we need the government data center assignments discussed earlier. So initially we will behave, uh, we've already been host, we've host, we are hosts to the submarine cable from uh, Los Angeles, California to Baler in Aurora province. And the, uh, toward the end of the program implementation, uh, the Western portion's connectivity to regional centers will be uh, procured also. Uh, next slide, please. So all in all, this is how we work. Uh, we, we, the ICT views the digital infrastructure of the world. Uh, not only the current infrastructure require uh, situation is concerned, but the pandemic also has uh, somewhat uh, pushed the, the ICT to take another closer look on the digital infrastructure uh, plan, came up with other uh, equally important uh, upgrading for us to to share with the local government units and the national government in agencies in the national capital region as well as in the regional centers. Uh, efficient, efficient and uh, uh, hopefully cheaper internet services. This will uh, give us some more productivity and uh, a contribution to the ease of doing, doing business program of the national government. So uh, I believe this is the last page. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the plan of your DICT. Uh, we hope that uh, as we move uh, along to uh, work on this uh, digital infrastructure plan, uh, we, I, I, I am asking everyone's uh, contribution in the public hearings that will be conducted so that uh, we can uh, come up with a much responsive uh, plan, uh, project and uh, that will redound to uh, improve the services of the national lo local governments. And uh, as mentioned by Dr. Urban Area Eldria, uh, to elevate the ranking of the, the, our country on the uh, digitization of government services or e-government. Thank you very much, Mabuay Kapil. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 
Dr. Antonio. Uh, we proceed now to our next speaker. I just wanted to check if people can see my presentation. Yes, uh, we can see. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for having me today and for the introduction, Dr. Jonathan Salvation and Dr. Orvin Yantos, um, Director Antonio Edward Padre, uh, Attorney Roy Ibai, uh, Dr. Romel Gomez, and to the participants of the Ninth Engineering Research and Development of Technology Congress, a pleasant afternoon to you all. Um, with the pandemic in our current situation, tech and digital solutions will enable a better life for Filipinos. At Globe, we continue to gear up for a sustainable digital future using a robust and pervasive network to carry on technological advancements that could help address everyday problems that people are facing. Today, we will be sharing the efforts of Globe, is, efforts Globe is undertaking to fulfill its digitalization objective. Um, in all our talks, some of you may have noticed a reiteration of our vision of a Philippines where family streams come true, businesses flourish, and the nation is admired. Our mission to create wonderful experiences for people to have choices, overcome challenges, and discover new ways to enjoy life. And our purpose of treating people right and creating a globe of good. It is in our vision, mission, and purpose that all our efforts are anchored on. And this allows us to continue creating wonderful. At the center of wonderful is a superior network experience and customer centricity, fueling our vision and the one globe ecosystem, our a robust 4G LTE and 5G network, supporting a growing customer base of 85 million Filipinos and as of the first half of 2021, data traffic of 1,700 petabytes. On top of this, we have provided a seamless ecosystem of customer-centric solutions that enrich the lives of customers even beyond telco by democratizing financial services, primary healthcare, and e-commerce. And while we deliver these, we also commit to a sustainable future. We believe that Given the limitations and challenges our country is facing, digital is truly the answer to many of our problems. The investments poured in and the accelerated network builds are now paying off. For this year alone, Globe is investing around 70 billion pesos, which is more than 40% of its revenues to the network. This 40% is one of the highest, if not the highest globally. Globe is also targeting to build 2,000 new sites in 2021 to increase the capacity and expand our network. With all these, the average download speeds in the country have more than doubled in the past year. Despite the geographical, topographical, and at times regulatory challenges with the fiber rollout, the Philippines has improved by 17 spots in the global rankings. Filipinos now enjoy an average download speed of 71.17 Mbps versus last year's 25.34 Mbps. Just like fiber, mobile, broadband, mobile download speeds have doubled, at, uh, have doubled to 33.69 Mbps and have improved 15 spots in the global ranking. These were achieved despite all the challenges that the pandemic has brought about. With the competition in the market and the scale that we have achieved, Filipinos enjoy the lowest internet pricing in our region, 
and one of the lowest in the world at 9 pesos per gigabyte. Even during this pandemic, we strive to provide new promos and services so more Filipinos can stay connected, especially with unconventional work and school setups. On the 5G front, the Philippines was recognized by Open Signal as a country with the biggest improvement in 5G internet speeds. We have experienced a 10 times improvement in download speeds at 141. 0.7 Mbps. The Philippines is also recognized as one of the top Asia-Pacific countries as far as 5G internet experience. To date, Globe has the most number of 5G subscribers at 700,000 uh, users, and we see this number continue to increase. Globe now has 5G outdoor coverage in at least 92% of the national capital region. It is also now accessible in Cebu, Boracay, Bacolod, Iloilo, Davao, CDO, and Jensen. Globe's unabated efforts to improve the country's state of connectivity have led to being recognized by UCLA as the most consistent mobile network for two consecutive quarters in 2021, with a consistency score of 70.43 in the first quarter and an improved 75.98 in the second quarter. Globe has also topped the Netflix ISP speed index with a score of 32 point Mbps, not far from the US score of 34, uh, 3.4 Mbps. Maintaining consistency of service is a true benchmark of our ability to deliver better network experiences to millions of Filipinos. As we build more infrastructure, we expect mobile internet experience to improve and bring us closer to a first world network. Despite the pandemic, Globe continues to invest in its network and expand nationwide. Given the substantial capex that has been poured in, we have been able to build and upgrade more towers and lay down fiber. To date, we have over 11,000 cell towers, of which 10,000 sites have been upgraded to 4G LTE, providing fast internet connectivity to over 90% of the population. And now we have over 18. 1,800 5G locations, and from Jan to June alone, Globe has been able to lay over 600,000 fiber lines, more than 60% of its 2021 target of 1 million lines. With the support of ARTA, the DICT, and DILG, and also the passing of the Bayan Yantulo, we secured 1,451 permits in the first six months of the year, and we continue to encourage the LGs to support the Bayanian Tulo so that we can hasten the upgrade of our network and experience in their areas. With a more superior mobile experience, 4G LT is a standard of connectivity in the country. Globe has embarked on a massive network upgrade to provide the latest 4G LTE technology nationwide. And one sure way to experience good connectivity is to change to a 4G LTE or 5G SIM and device, or install fiber for home connectivity. With this, we encourage subscribers who are still using 3G SIM cards to change the 5G ready, 4G LTE SIMs to take full advantage of our improved services. Customers are assured that their mobile numbers are retained when they switch to the new mobile data standard. If quarantine protocols in their respective areas allow, Customers can go to the nearest Globe store to change their SIM cards for free. So if you are still on a 3G device and SIM, go get your 4G and 5G enabled phone and SIM so that you can enjoy first world connectivity. At home, the internet has also become indispensable to most of us. It's our lifeline, especially during this unusual time. In this pandemic, we've seen the market shift to fiber as people needed better connectivity to support whatever they had to do at home, work, learn, and even for entertainment. Globe has ongoing efforts to upgrade our customers from wireless and copper to fiber so that our subscribers can enjoy more stable and faster connectivity at home. Beyond meeting internet connectivity standards, customer service expectations has also increased. 
Globe at Home has increased its technician support teams by 80% versus last year to meet customer expectations for installation, repair, upgrade, and migration service needs. The self-service Globe at Home app has also been reinforced to give customers a hassle-free digital channel where they can easily pay, upgrade, and request for assistance. With a robust and expansive network, we are gearing up for a tomorrow by enabling digital solutions that will improve the lives of Filipinos. Gcash, for one, is now the country's top mobile wallet with over 40 million registered users and over 1.9 million merchants and social sellers. Gcash is also able to service the UMBAP and extend this inclusion to the other parts of the country. This pandemic has seen the accelerated adoption of mobile money, given that it is safer and more convenient than transacting in cash. Since then, Gcash has expanded from just being a transactional app to a lifestyle app with e-commerce platform like GLife, savings feature with GSave, investments via G-Invest, and even a chance to contribute to the environment through GForest. Consulta MD has also gained more significance as people now see the value and convenience of accessing doctors without risking going to hospitals for primary consultations. At only 60 pesos per month, we have democratized access to healthcare and have contributed to accessing, addressing the scarcity of doctors and clinics in many parts of the country. Investing in solutions is another significant aspect that GLOBE is focusing on through its corporate venture builder, 917 Ventures, which by the way, is the largest corporate venture builder in the country today. This allows Globe to maximize our assets to ideate, launch, and accelerate digital business ideas. Imagine the tech we can develop and incubate for the near future. Kickstart, on the other hand, is the Philippines' most active venture capital firm, backed by Globe and the Ayala ecosystem, Kickstart continues to invest in the future of data, logistics, and media for national development. Um, future readiness is of utmost importance, and we encourage everyday digital use for Filipinos. We also arm our customers for a sustainable future. Oops. Globe is also working closely with Ayala Group in integrating sustainability practices into the group's operations and programs. Our objective is to be very socially and sustainably real company because that way we ensure that this country and the world sustains itself throughout as we progress. We are committed to upholding the United Nations Global Compact Principles and contribute to the 10 UN Sustainable Development Goals among which is UN SDG number nine that highlights the roles of infrastructure and innovation as crucial drivers of economic growth and development. Technology is constantly changing and ever evolving around the world. New needs that are massively dependent on ICT to thrive in the new normal have emerged. Technology plays an integral role for initiatives to come to life. The effects of this pandemic particularly in the advancement of digital adoption, will definitely stay and affect the way we work, we study, and promote awareness campaigns. Assessing our readiness as a country is, a vital, is vital in identifying gaps in order to move forward. Armed with our infrastructure investments and robust and expansive network, Globe is poised to better serve our customers and uplift their quality of life with impactful innovations. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Vincent Tempongko. Now we would like to invite to the virtual stage attorney Roy Cecil Ibai to discuss building digital infrastructure for digital Philippines. Sir.
Good afternoon. Um, yes. Um, may I request the PowerPoint presentation? Uh, if if you can kindly up upload it, please. Right, sir. Loading now, sir. Good, sir. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, to all the participants of this uh, uh, Congress, this ERDT Congress, uh, of course, uh, to the organizers, uh, Dr. Jonathan Salvacion, Dr. Orvin Liantos, and to um, my co-discussants, uh, uh, DICT Director uh, Antonio Padre, and also to Mr. Vince uh, Temponco, a pleasant good afternoon. So um, the, the title of my uh, presentation is basically Building Digital Infrastructure for uh, Digital Philippines. And uh, first of all, uh, in behalf of uh, PLDT and SMART, we thank uh, everyone for uh, giving us the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Um, next slide, please. So we all know that um, telecommunications through the years has um, contributed a lot, no? not only in terms of uh, digital uh, communication. Uh, of course, we started from the analog era and then uh, we moved on to uh, now to the uh, so-called digital revolution. And... Um, uh, even as we know what the, the goings on in the world, especially now that, uh, for example, what happened in, uh, in Afghanistan, without the power of telecommunications there, then uh, we'd actually be blind with uh, what, what, uh, what is happening no, in, in uh, certain parts of the world. So let me start with a quote from uh, Mr. Rupert Murdoch, which states that advances in the technology of telecommunications have proved an unambiguous threat to totalitarian regimes everywhere. So um, for me, uh, given my uh, profession as a lawyer, the utmost importance of uh, tele telecommunications is really the preservation of liberties, no? the freedom of communication, although it encompasses and straddles uh, so many aspects of, our, of, of life. No? You have uh, telecommunications now in medicine, telemedicine, you have um, telecommunications uh, in uh, engineering. You have telecommunications in business. In fact, with the pandemic now, practically the world uh, is uh, uh, running on uh, telecommunication uh, fumes. <laughs> uh, given the limitations, to a lot of face-to-face -face meetings and all that. Here in the Philippines, education has highly relied now on uh, the internet or the power of the internet. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, for PLDT and SMART, for the wireless, as of uh, August, we have a total of um, 10,753 physical sites, uh, 90... 5% of which are 3G and LTE. Next slide, please. For fiber, we have a uh, fiber footprint as of uh, August uh, of about 555,106 kilometers. Next slide, please. In terms of permitting, uh, well, this is uh, one of the major challenges that uh, I guess all telcos uh, encounter during this pandemic. But uh, 
as uh, as of um August uh, we were able to secure a total of 2293 since last year no since the start of this uh the, this pandemic because of um laws enacted uh, since last year like the Bayanihan Act and the efforts from the ARTA have actually helped accelerate our rollout by streamlining permitting processes. And we also have to uh, include the NTC and the DICT in, the, in this um, uh, efforts to help uh, expedite no, a lot of these uh, uh, issues that uh, normally during the, the pre-pandemic uh, times, we had encountered a lot of difficulty. No? Uh, in getting and securing uh, uh, consent from um, the barangay up to the municipal or provincial uh, boards. Next slide, please. So just as a comparison, um, in terms of uh, speeds, the Philippines ranks 72nd now out of 139 in global ranking while it ranks 23rd in Asia. Smart in comparison has a national speed of 48.18 Mbps for download and 10.38 Mbps for upload. Smart would have ranked uh, if the Philippines ranks uh, 72nd, SMART would have ranked uh, 25th in Asia, while uh, the Philippines would have ranked uh, uh, global ranking when ranked 23rd in Asia, uh, SMART would have ranked 25th. Okay, in terms of fixed, the Philippines ranks 63rd out of 183 in global ranking, while it ranks 17th in Asia. PLDT has a national speed of 91.28 Mbps uh, for download, and it would have ranked 21st in Asia. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So we now move on to certain problem areas that uh, specifically we encountered no? during uh, during the past year. Uh, so um, some LGUs actually continue still uh, to impose unjust, excessive, oppressive, and confiscatory regulatory fees. No? They use the non-payment of these regulatory fees to withhold issuance of building and or other local permits. Some LGUs require that permit applications should be approved by the city and municipal council. No? Because the Bayanihan Act actually already uh, dispensed with that requirement, no? but there are still some LGUs that uh, require that uh, that requirement. And then there are certain LGUs that these, and then there are some barangays that still insist that telcos should apply for. Uh, resolutions instead of barangay clearances. 
some barangays refuse to issue uh, clearances or resolutions because they still give way so much weight to homeowners association uh, uh, clearances. And then independent of the barangays, there are still some issues pertaining to homeowners associations that still object to telcos uh, being powers within their uh, respective subdivisions. There are also issues that HOA in, in, um, in exchange for issuing their uh, would collect their subdivisions in order for uh, telcos to build uh, their uh, facilities within the subdivisions. Then we also have the, uh, the Department Order of the DPWH, uh, Order Number 73 and 26, which remains uh, pending. This actually gives uh, freedom uh, to the DPWH to uh, wantonly remove whatever telecommunication infrastructure there is on the road right of way without giving us ample uh, 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 space not to, to, to transfer or where, where we can relocate. And then we also have some LGUs that require right now to remove existing overhead cable connections and to place them underground. Also are a few LGUs implementing a one pole policy, meaning you only have to deal with a one, one entity, the power cooperative, to uh, install that, uh, the, the pole. No? And then we have several applications, special land use permits, and special use agreements. Our problems with the Indus people, the National Council of Indigenous People, which has a long and tedious process on securing permits. And then there are also some LGUs that withhold permits if we do our on machines, even if our franchise states that we are exempt on our radios and the uh, radio equipment. Next slide, please. Next slide, Next slide, please. Okay. So for the PLDT group, our massive network investments will continue. We have uh, invested 260 billion pesos in the past five years. In 2021, we'll invest up to 92 billion for network expansion. Next slide, please. Currently, our wireless population coverage is about 96% of the Philippines with an average download speed of 23 Mbps. And that's for the wireless. And But for the fixed, we are, we're about 95% of cities and municipalities, and we're about 32.8 Mbps average download speed for, uh, for the fixed uh, internet. So next slide, please. We intend to elevate the Philippines to the global standard. For fixed, we intend that uh, the minimum average broadband speed for, e for any of our subscribers will be at 20 Mbps. We will intend to replace our legacy DSL copper subscribers and migrate all of them to fiber and fiber-like services. 5% by the end of 2021 and 100% by the mid of 2022. For mobile, we intend to at least cover 51% of the population coverage at 60 Mbps by 2022. And by 20, fast forward to 2025, we intend that at least 84% of the population will be at 60 Mbps. But we can only achieve this if 
um, our consumers will also adapt to newer devices, no? Because then again, uh, you're only also as good as the 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 end user device that uh, that you use. So if your user device at currently does not run on 5G, then you cannot enjoy actually the services of uh, the the faster 5G internet service, no? broadband service. Next slide, please. So we're leading in independent studies um, for a uh, fixed network. We're uh, at 30.68 Mbps. For uh, smart, we've been branded as the fastest fixed and mobile network by UCLA last year. Uh, for the wireless network, uh, our... Uh, as of end of 2020, we were at 19.45 Mbps, which is higher than the Philippines average of 16.89 Mbps. And again, as I stated earlier, we're even faster uh, by, uh, by July of 2021. Umlot has won the Best in Test Award, Best Rated Broadband Coverage and Download and Latency Experience. And Open Signal has given us a video experience score of 42.2, better than competition and national average. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions later, I'll be happy to uh, oblige and uh, respond to your uh, questions or clarification. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Attorney Roy Ibai. Now we would like to call on our next presenter. Yes. So thank you very much. I wonder if I could uh, share my screen. Yes, Paul Professor Gomez. Thank you. Thank, thank you very good. much. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to do it. Okay. So uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon. Thank you very much for the organizers for this invitation to uh, present my views on, uh, on the opportunities for digital transformation for the Philippines. And I would like to focus specifically on uh, education. I'm a professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering at the University of Maryland at uh, College Park. Now, based on a market report, Uh, compiled by McKinsey and Associates in, um, uh, in, in 2018, Internet of Things or IoT has a potential market value between three to six trillion US dollars uh, worldwide by 2025. Now that amount of money is a lot. It's about a quarter of the GDP of the United States and about 15 times the GDP of uh, the Philippines. Uh, you can see that it is at par with cloud technology, which is an allied field of uh, Internet of Things. Only mobile internet and artificial intelligence have higher potentials. Now, even those areas that we commonly associate with uh, big markets like oil exploration, energy, and advanced materials are dwarfed by the economic impact, impact of, uh, of IoT. Uh, IoT uh, has touched nearly all, all aspects of our society, and I'm probably preaching to the choir. Uh, it has allowed us to have better quality of lives, more efficiently use our resources, and improve our economy. The opportunities seem endless. So we use uh, uh, IoT is now uh, used in modern manufacturing, so-called Industry 4.0 or digital twins, uh, to deliver sophisticated products at significantly lower cost. It is used to monitor metabolic systems from smart watches to diagnostic instruments in, in, in hospitals. And in fact, recently IoT has proven to be a tool against uh, the COVID-19. Uh, it is, IoT is used in monitoring our environment, weather prediction, disaster mitigation, and the overall health of our planet. It is used in modern cities all over the world it is used in um, uh, delivering supplies, uh, in logistics, for example. Um, it, uh, I'm always amazed that I'm or I order 
a rather exotic item from Amazon Prime and often get it to me within 24 hours from the time of ordering. It's, it's, it's amazing that they could do that. And that's because of, 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 of IoT. Uh, it's used in smart farming. Uh, where precisely measured quantities of water, fertilizer, nutrients are delivered at the exact time that the plants need them. And so there are many other as uh, many uh, uh, uses of, uh, of IoT, and some of them might be familiar. Uh, we now have Alexas and Googles uh, that makes our home uh, smart. We now have uh, at least the beginnings of uh, self-driving cars uh, and trucks. We have renewable energy, and yes, uh, this is big uh, among young people, internet gaming. IoT is everywhere. Now, who will then uh, capture this uh, opportunity? Well, there are jobs. Uh, as a result of this tremendous uh, market, uh, this, this uh, penetration, uh, this market penetration, jobs are plentiful. Uh, software developer, software analyst, hardware developer, applications developer, and so on, full stack developer, and, uh, and many, many more. Uh, there is a worldwide shortage in these high-tech jobs, at least from the state I come from, uh, Maryland. Uh, we, uh, we, have, uh, we need uh, about um, a, thousand, uh, a thousand of these, um, these IT uh, professionals for every 10 uh, that we produce. And uh, so, and then this is true for just about any state and probably, uh, many countries, many developed countries in, in the world. You know, I believe that the Philippines can play a very important role in filling those vacancies. Well, after all, the Philippines, one of our exports is human resources, but perhaps it is time to augment the Philippines' offerings beyond the traditional sectors like construction, uh, healthcare, uh, domestic assistance, shipping service sectors, etc., and perhaps augment it with high-tech jobs such as, uh, such as uh, those in the IoT field. Of course, educating the Filipinos is the start. So let me introduce an engineering degree that is focused specifically on training students on how to take advantage of this demand, okay? It is really patterned. This is patterned after a new program we have recently launched uh, a couple of years ago and have been quite successful in uh, placing our graduates in the, in the industry. The, the starting salaries are, are, are quite high because of course it's the law of supply and demand. And there's quite a bit of uh, uh, demand. And so the salaries they receive are quite, quite, uh, quite, quite good. So the way we structure this is that the program accepts students who have already completed two years of college in any engineering or STEM related areas. So we expect them to have completed all of the general education courses and uh, the requisite science and math courses, perhaps up to the level of uh, calculus three or differential equations, that's really all. And, uh, and hopefully those who have done reasonably well in them. Now, this is uh, based on uh, an ABET accreditation uh, requirement, but it's also good uh, for, our, uh, for our major. So once accepted in the major, the students will just need 20 credits, or in the Philippines, 20 units of advanced courses in their junior and senior years. We really do not believe that it's an engineering degree should be five years, because that's one extra year of lost uh, opportunity for the student as far as uh, 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 making uh, money, uh, income, for example. So these 20 credits of advanced courses, they are designed to have a good balance between theory and, uh, and practice with significant world, uh, real world uh, hands-on uh, experience. So what are these? Now, many of us, many of uh, the, in the audience are probably quite familiar with computer science or computer uh, engineering uh, degrees. And so I think uh, it makes sense to perhaps highlight these distinctions. I know this is a very busy slide, but bear with me. Uh, the embedded systems uh, labeled there in green. This is a Venn diagram of the computer science degree, computer engineering degree, and uh, the embedded systems uh, degree. Now, all of them share the same 
core foundations, and that is coding, you know, software coding, discrete structures, algorithms, and computer arch architecture. Uh, in the computer uh, engineering, in, in, in uh, computer science, we share embedded systems, share computer networks and cloud computing. And on the computer engineering side, which uh, is really very hardware orient oriented, the, uh, the embedded systems share digital and analog circuits, computer hardware, microprocessors, and of course, cyber physical systems. But what makes this program even more distinctive is the fact that in addition to these classic courses, we are focusing on embedded systems. They specialize in, in uh, communication networks, uh, cloud services, services, and uh, machine learning tools and, and algorithms. So that's the foundation. That's basically all there is to this, uh, this uh, model that uh, we're proposing. So here's a, 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 a sample track. So in the first semester, uh, students would take uh, about five courses or so on uh, analog circuits, digital circuits, discrete structures, C or C++ uh, programming, introduction to IoT, where they get introduced to things like Azure, uh, Amazon Web Services, etc. And then, uh, and then, of course, a, 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 a course in uh, probability and statistics, which is, of course, essential in any engineering degree. In the second semester, we uh, dive a little bit deeper, and then students actually learn a little bit more about microelectronics and sensors at the level of gates, uh, computer organization, algorithms with specific emphasis on Python, because Python is beginning to be a very, very uh, uh, ubiquitous language that almost all uh, techies speak. And then uh, is networks and protocols. This is where we teach students about gateways and switches and routers uh, and the different protocols and uh, uh, layers associated with, with networks. And then uh, the, 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 the fifth course on the second semester is really uh, uh, the beginning of uh, a full stack development. So we teach students a web-based application development from uh, you know, from the back end to the, from the front end to the, to the uh, uh, back end. And that constitutes the first, uh, the first semester, the first year. And the second year, it's uh, advanced uh, FPGA uh, uh, system design. Now, uh, uh, there are many tools to use uh, as far as FPGA uh, are concerned. Um, uh, field programmable get erase, of course. Uh, this is uh, something uh, we use uh, Verilog uh, uh, as, as the software of choice. And then, of course, on operating systems for embedded systems. This is real time operating systems for scheduling. Uh, precise scheduling is, uh, is uh, taken quite seriously. That's why it's uh, our toss. Okay. And then we have embedded systems. This embedded systems uh, course discusses uh, firmware uh, uh, more of, and, and a lot more of the more uh, uh, advanced uh, techniques that are, uh, uh, are coming out. Uh, we have this uh, uh, system on chips, PSOCs, uh, et cetera. And then uh, network security. Uh, and then uh, it's the first semester of what uh, we call, uh, in the Philippines, it's called thesis, but we call them capstone design experience. And so that would constitute the third semester. And on their, first, uh, on their fourth semester, we now deal with the security uh, of uh, embedded systems. You know, nowadays, there are on-chip uh, security um, uh, measures uh, that rely on the specifics of the manufacturing process. And that is deemed to be highly secure. And that's something that we uh, teach the students. And of course, we have advanced software for connected systems, machine learning tools and algorithm. And, uh, and finally, we complement that with technical writing. We believe that, um, uh, that, uh, that effective engineers are those who can also express themselves completely and fully from the documentation of their codes to presentations. And, uh, and then finally, that's, and then we have the second uh, semester, second uh, 
second semester of their capstone design experience were are very, very specific to uh, applications uh, of, uh, of IoT devices. So that in a, in a, in a, in a nutshell is the course that uh, we were offering. And uh, I really believe that uh, uh, curriculum like this would uh, be beneficial uh, in the Philippine setting and perhaps beneficial to uh, produce uh, able um, uh, workers in the field in this highly, highly, very high demand field of uh, I IoT, for which the Philippines, I think, can play a very important role. Uh, yes, uh, India, uh, Singapore, and China have done this uh, decades earlier than us, but I think that there is still an opportunity because we can leverage the fact that a lot of our, uh, a lot of our economy, a uh, good portion of our economy is based on uh, human resource uh, uh, exports. So with that, let me, uh, let me uh, mention that uh, the laboratory equipment uh, that would be required for such a program are fairly modest. Uh, a GPU cluster uh, for uh, um, intensive uh, computations for machine learning and so on would be needed uh, power uh, servers, of course, uh, routers, and of course the traditional scopes, signal generators, and uh, various components. And so it's actually very uh, uh, economical to develop such a, uh, such a program. In fact, we've done this at uh, the University of Maryland with rather minimal, minimal cost. So uh, the take home message uh, in closing uh, the Philippines is le leading export of human resources. In, uh, I looked in Google and uh, in um, uh, uh, last year, uh, the remittances contributed to 39 billion to the Philippine economy and that's, that's enormous. Now, most of these jobs are in the areas of healthcare, construction, engineer, administration, and, and, and teaching. Uh, the worldwide demand for competent software and hardware developers in the field of embedded systems and IoT is very strong, and I can speak from experience. I believe that the Philippines could be uh, an active player in this field, and the first step is education at the uh, graduate level, and I have just presented a roadmap. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there's any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them for you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gomez, for that uh, presentation. Uh, I have prepared here some uh, set of questions, but uh, I guess I have to start first with our uh, first speaker and then come back to you later. So um, I would like to go back to Director Antonio Edward Padre. Uh, sir, thank you very much for presenting the plans for uh, the National Broadband Plan in the Philippines. And it's, uh, the plan is quite helpful. And uh, it's actually something that uh, we need for our country. Now, um, I have been through, um, I am also uh, involved with the ICT in one way, right? conducting a series of lectures for digital transformation. And uh, together with the LGU, I would, uh, would ask from them, like for example, I would ask like, uh, how many of you have been uh, fully migrated to the cloud? And uh, how many of you have uh, been fitted from, from the elasticity and all the cloud LG has to offer? I guess many of the LGUs that I have talked with are actually preserving their uh, decision to move really fully to the cloud because of the uh, availability of internet connection and their connectivity towards the technology. So um, my question is, uh, first, my question is, do we have target dates for the rollout of satellite and the free Wi-Fi for all? Because the need uh, is uh, significant for these technologies in this time of the pandemic, as uh, mentioned also, especially in the education sector. Uh, yes, uh, doctor, thank you very much. <coughs> For the free Wi-Fi, uh, uh, we've been uh, rolling out the free Wi-Fi uh, 
Uh, actually, we have around 7,000 active uh, access points spread nationwide now. Uh, supposedly, that, that should be around uh, 18,000 <laughs> since we started rolling out. But the problem is uh, the infrastructure is uh, quite challenging because uh, what the government through the ICT is uh, asking is a CIR or committed internet rate. But the problem is uh, uh, first, it's kind of challenging uh, or expensive. And second, uh, uh, we are still uh, working on the data and the user, user's uh, requirement. Because it kind, it's kind of uh, about the planning if we, we allot, uh, say, 30 uh, or, or 5 gigabit to 10 gigabit uh, CIR to a particular place and uh, only around 30% would be used. So that is uh, not that good. That's why uh, we are monitoring. Uh, there is a network monitoring system that we have with all the free Wi-Fi sites of, uh, and the contracts that we have with the private sector and the providers. And uh, toward the end of the year, we'll be coming up with more focused to usage requirement plan in the allocation of the bandwidth for the free Wi-Fi. Um, for the satellite, uh, we've already rolled out through managed uh, services, 1,035 sites across uh, Ajida. So 1,035 sites. And we, we, we were uh, on the implementation report, we are at 70% uh, already rolled out. And uh, th those uh, sites involve uh, two megabit uh, CIR. It's kind of uh, expensive because we are. Uh, it, it would be uh, un unacceptable if we offer a burstable speed, and then uh, the local people will be flocking on the area where the the access point is located and uh, would uh, queue to gain uh, access to the internet. So we we, we want uh, the ICT wants to, to subscribe to CIR for the cloud. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are hosting 32 government agencies on the cloud. We have uh, several subscriptions from uh, global providers um, cloud resources. Um, we, are, we are going to, we are on the planning stage of mixing up or working on a hybrid uh, setup of uh, data physical data centers and cloud resources uh, for, uh, for it to complement uh, so that it would complement each other whenever one is probably down or on technical uh, manage, uh, maintenance. So uh, those host being hosted will not uh, experience, will avoid experiencing downtime as well. Uh, there are proponents from other global uh, cloud service providers. And we are also welcoming the time that uh, domestic providers will also offer services just to prop up the local, the, the domestic economy. Because at the moment, at the rate that we are now, is uh, we are propping up the global economy and not and, uh, having a, a almost nil uh, support to the domestic economy. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, the stakeholders understand that we need to, if they can subscribe uh, cheaper bulk uh, cloud resources and then share, is, share it with us with a minimal uh, revenue so that we can uh, provide uh, a domestic uh, managed uh, resources that that would be good yes, sir. Uh, definitely will be because we've issued two, two, two years ago uh, the ICT, the ICT issued already the cloud first policy yes sir and uh, of course, the national government is also already clamoring at the DICT because uh, that would uh, eliminate the maintenance requirements that uh, will be shouldered by the, the, the various government agencies. Uh, we are looking at uh, once uh, by, by 2022, the, the, the request from the local government units in so far as cloud uh, resources will really go up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Now, this is sort of uh, 
sort of follow up because I think this is uh, in relation to what was presented by attorney D. by a while ago. So uh, this is just a sort of a question. Also, I'm just wondering: can can the ICT propose policy to the LGUs to fast track the installation of towers for better internet connectivity in the country? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, last week, uh, with the with the help and attend attend, it was attended by uh, private te telecommunications company representative officers. We launched the online. Uh, uh, monitoring uh, system for permitting of uh, 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 telecom uh, in tower construction as well as uh, hopefully the rollout of uh, for the permitting requirement of uh, uh, the rollout of uh, fiber optics. It, it's a real time monitoring system uh, that uh, shows the public where the permit is, uh, the processing is. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so, so maybe if we have that, then we can have better, uh, uh, faster installation of these towers. Uh, now. Yes, uh, yes, doctor. Uh, <clears throat> I enjoy everyone here uh, attending this uh, session to take a look at the, the, the ICT website. I think the link and the services is already incorporated in the our official website so that you can also take a look everyone is uh, authorized to, to open the url so that you can uh, take a look at how the permitting is moving from the application toward the internal processes of the respective government agencies at unreal time sir thank you okay thank you very much director uh, padre so now we proceed with our, we have, we have actually questions here from, uh, from the YouTube participants and we're going to, uh, we're going to entertain them that later uh, after, after these uh, questions that we have here. So this is actually addressed to uh, both uh, Mr. Pimpong for an attorney Levi. So you can just like take turns in asking this question. So um, the question is, during the pandemic, apps now serve as the bridge to avail services in ways not thought of to happen daily. Apps like food delivery, chatting, and education, to mention the list, are now accessible through the apps heavily relying on the internet. For apps planning to deliver a much better experience through faster response times, what are the benefits of an application certified by your telephone? Maybe we can start with Mr. Kim Pongko. Okay, okay. Um, thank you for your question. No? Um, Globe is going beyond telco at this point um, with beyond its digital infrastructure, as you, I've shown earlier, um, we've invested a lot on our infrastructure, which is our underlying platform for digital services. And uh, we have applications such as GCAT, which is an application right now, okay? And uh, we've been developing um, and encouraging um, digital uh, app services uh, development uh, through our ventures, uh, corporate venture. Now. Um, and uh, we see that um, across all of our digital services uh, that there is an uptake as far as uh, the subscribers are concerned. And we foresee that um, digital services will continue and will be part of the Filipino life now, uh, moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, for, for, uh, for like startups that wanted to certify their services to your telco, what are the advantages of this kind of thing? Um, I'm not sure, really sure. Uh, can you repeat the question? Are you talking about certification of application? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, certification of certain application from uh, third party startups, not, not really in not really inside okay. of the ecosystem. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, got it. Um the 917 Ventures uh uh subsidiary no, encourages uh individuals to develop their own services. And we have a process no, or a means to help uh these developers to um build further on their, uh, what they have developed. And uh, we have a group in 911 that uh, helps them find ways on how to improve their services and how to uh, uh, make them more robust and also help them leverage the 
resources of globe no uh, may it be through capital seeding no uh, through 917 or even our kickstart ventures okay thank you very much mr kento now uh, okay. can we proceed to authority by the same question yes oh thank you thank you for the question um on the part of uh, the pldt group basically aside or apart from what i mentioned earlier we are also uh, aiming uh that uh, the pldt uh, foster or come up and develop that uh, our country become the next data center hub of the asia pacific uh, uh, region no? meaning uh, of late uh, just recently we we signed a um, a memorandum of agreement last uh, september 1 with the with the DICT, the DTI, the BUI, and the DOE to draw in global hyperscalers no, in the Philippines. So when you say global hyperscalers, these are the, the mega uh, IT companies no, like uh, Google, you know, like uh, Amazon, like uh, other content providers like Netflix, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. No? So, so this is in order also for for our country to to be uh, known as a reliable and dependent ICT hub meaning <clears throat> when we start <clears throat> drawing in all these hyperscalers naturally the the downstream is that our workers will also get employed no and uh, and vice versa there'll be an exchange of ICT uh, development there'll be an exchange of a lot of information ideas and uh, we will all be brought in the, the, to this uh, whole uh, economic uh, ICT boom no, that uh, all these global hyperscalers will uh, eventually bring into the country. No? So, so that, that is in addition to, to what I already mentioned that, of course, in order to, to bring growth to the countryside, you have to make sure that the broadband infrastructure will have to be robust. No? So, uh, well, again, again, also similar to Globe, we also have our... Um, ICT growth initiatives for startups and then all, all the other small development. But um, we believe that uh, before any of this can can be uh, no, can be uh, sparked, you need to have a good infrastructure in place. You no, know, especially going through. Hopefully, we will be able to also address all these unserved and underserved areas uh, in 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 uh, the soonest possible time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Attorney Dita. So um, we now proceed with um, uh, proceed with uh, Dr. Gomez. So uh, it's quite interesting to see the proposed curriculum for IoT and how we can like uh, leverage the human capital out in the Philippines to contribute to this uh, era of uh, Internet of Things. So uh, my, my my first question is um, future is uh, I mean in the comment that, that the future is exciting with the introduction of the curriculum for the embedded system. Do you have plans to partner with Philippine schools to draft and propose the curriculum to Chad? Oh, that's a that's a very interesting. Uh, 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 I I could not speak for 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 of course for for my university, but as uh, but as a Filipino, and I've also been involved with the Philippines quite uh, um, in a number of years. Uh, I was a public scientist, and so on. But I would be, I would be delighted to talk to uh, universities or colleges or uh, uh, you know technical schools who might be interested in in adopting this model. And I'd be very happy to share some of our experiences and uh, some of our curriculum for, for them, of course. So uh, your question of plans, uh, there's always plans, right? Uh, so, but, but the desire is there, but the desire is there for me anyway. Yeah, Th thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Vena. So um, my, my second question is, uh, do we have established accrediting agencies for the proposed curriculum? Uh, your qu the qu I, I do not know the, I, I am. I'm only aware of the accreditation, uh, the engineering accreditation. It's it's called ABET, and I believe that uh, a couple or three schools now in the Philippines 
have a bet accreditation. Uh, I could be wrong; it could be four uh, on specific areas in computer engineering, I think, and uh, and uh, and uh, computer science, or uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, it's computer engineering and and electrical engineering. Uh, I do not know of any accredited accrediting body that's specific to the Philippines uh, alone. Uh, I'm not aware of this, but as far as this program is concerned. It is. Uh, it uh, we are going to have a full credit accreditation uh, in the third year. The, the The process for accreditation is that you should have data for at least three years uh, of uh, of uh, offering the program before you could be evaluated for uh, ABET accreditation. But in the construction of this curriculum, all of the requirements for ABET uh, have been satisfied. You know, they, they have the so-called one to seven uh, student outcomes. They have the requisite number of courses in the sciences and math and engineering. All of that have been accounted for in this curriculum that, uh, that uh, framework that I just shared with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Dona. So okay. we have here questions from our participants from uh, YouTube. So I guess uh, it, uh, Amy Fallon can, can actually answer this one. And I guess uh, I, uh, Dr. Gomez can state your the answer later for question number two. So for question number one, how can we keep the momentum for our digital infrastructure investments? Are there any incentives in place to encourage more invest, investments for this area? Maybe we can start with uh, the ICT. Actually, sir, uh, I think the in, uh, incentives on uh, the rollout of telecommunications infrastructure is still the same as uh, mm. those being offered by the Bureau of Investments. Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, the ICT can offer is uh, the uh, we can help the representatives or contractors of the the telecommunications companies uh, go through the and uh, a little bit of lighter processing of the ingress requirements in uh, local government units. Uh, we just want to ask them to collaborate with our regional offices so that. Uh, they can be assisted, uh, especially in the pandemic control area. Thank you. Thank you very much. About uh, insights from uh, Mr. Pimpongto. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I'm not really sure if we have to be further encouraged to invest in digital infrastructure. As mentioned earlier, um, we are already investing more than 40% of our revenues to the network. Okay. So... Um, that actually puts a strain on our balance sheet, if you will. Okay. Um, I think what we could do is really having um, or leveraging uh, more shared infrastructure okay, to relieve uh, the various telcos of the CapEx pressures on our end. Okay. Uh, two, uh, maybe encourage government no, to invest, uh, uh, co invest with the private sector, um, especially for missionary sites in uh, you know these uh, underserved or unserved areas where the financial viability is really uh, not there and uh, hoping that government could make it uh, you know more viable for um, for the private sector to go to those areas no? and lastly um, one thing that we are also pushing is uh, allows to do co-build um, with the government uh, uh, programs no um, simple example would be, um, you know, riding on our build, build, build uh, program, you know, uh, allowing telcos or even utility companies in general to uh, co-build you know, as DPWH you know, uh, builds roads and uh, allow us to put in our conduits uh, while they're constructing these roads, which makes uh, the cost you know, uh, more viable for the private sector. And that's it for my end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, can you have an insight also from Attorney Yes. Um, 
Well, first, let, let me comment. No? Uh, just the other day, I think uh, the DICT went to Congress to uh, propose to, uh, no, no, uh, their budget no, for uh, next year. And um, mm. imagine from 32, something like 30 plus billion, it was Congress approved something like only 9 billion no? <laughs> uh, for their budget, uh, giving the reason that um, the SUF payments paid by telcos for the past years were really not um, effectively utilized, I think. No? But then again, the heart of the issue here is that the question, I think, is on incentives. No, uh, Yes, uh, incentive is, is always welcome. No, It's it's candy. To, it's ear candy to us telcos to hear about being offered incentives to, to be able to bring in uh, capital equipment uh, free of tax or, you know, and... Uh, uh, to 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 have uh, more tax deductibles and tax uh, reductions, but basically, uh, I think the best uh, thing that government really can uh, now offer is to rationalize all these regulatory fees no, that um, they are assessing as telcos, because even as we speak, while we we contribute uh, uh, more than the the PLDT group alone no, contributes more than uh, five billion no, in terms of uh, regulatory payments to one agency alone, which is the NTC. And this this doesn't even include the, the tax payments that we pay in terms of the BIR and um, the local governments. Uh, and, and this supposedly under the free public Wi-Fi law should be utilized by the DICT. But uh, I don't think there's really a mechanism right now that enables the DICT to, to do such. You know? So uh, number one, um, it would also be better to seek a balance no, between all these uh, unreasonable regulatory fees. And I say unreasonable because the Supreme Court actually laid down the principle that regulatory fees should only be commensurate to the cost of supervision uh, and regulation. So if, if the agency like the NTC, uh, I, I don't think it needs so many billions of pesos no, to to really oversee us telcos uh, the way what the, the way we're supposed to run our business so this this billions of pesos instead of being paid as um, as a spectrum users fee and as a supervision or regulatory fee can be diverted to hard infrastructure that we that telcos can reinvest into the market to be able to to purchase more capex to be able to roll out in areas where uh, they are served and under, uh, unserved and underserved, then I think uh, we will be able to work hand in hand with the DICT in terms of uh, being able to cover much of uh, uh, the places or areas in the country where there is little or no uh, telecommunication service to speak of. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Attorney Ibai. So um, thank you very much, Director Padre. I guess. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, while uh, Mr. Timpong and Attorney Ibai actually say something about these incentives, we have uh, like a like reaction from uh, Director Pate. So yeah, I guess it could, it, could, it could be considered that as a welcome development. Now, for our uh, final question uh, for Professor Gomez, so we are actually like uh, having uh, participants from the YouTube, so we do not have access to our chat. So may we request you to answer the question. Aside from offering advanced courses covering the relevant curricula, sir, how else can we develop our IoT human resources? Uh, that's a that's a actually very good question. I'd like to point out that um, that the curriculum that I I, I showed you is uh, not rigid. I think that uh, the field has now evolved in uh, in a direction where where you can get to the same place in many directions. This curriculum is curated. This is what we would offer in order for uh, someone to have a generalized understanding of the field and therefore uh, uh, make contributions. But this is by no means unique. As a matter of fact, I do think that there are plenty of opportunities for people, even without having to have a degree in, in the, to actually make a, a positive contribution. Case in point, I have a nephew who his interest was just dabbling on on um, on uh, on uh, uh, microprocessor boards when he was a, a, a little kid. He didn't have uh, any other interest. He 
was not interested in 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 in, in uh, engineering at all. He was just in, interested in, in doing that uh, uh, thing. And uh, so I brought him that to, to the attention of, hey, this might be some areas that you might consider uh, improving. And he had done quite well. It's because he uh, he loves this. And so he became very good in uh, in, in Java, in, uh, in this traditional, uh, and also he's a very creative uh, character. And as a result, Google has hired him. And uh, the kid is seven, 18 years old now, I think, you know, uh, right out of uh, high school. Uh, I think, you know, he's now second year in, uh, in, in college. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is the curriculum I told you is one way. That's just the curated view, right? But that does not mean that you cannot you cannot be a player in the field. Now I mentioned in the in the chat, right now the big the big uh, uh, opportunities are in this thing called machine learning and artificial intelligence. There's a lot of investment in game in, in, in that area, and so I said, look, take advantage of open source. That's the beauty of of of. Uh, uh, this field is that people are not uh, stingy in offering in offering uh, 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 instruction. So, and there are open source uh, uh, environments everywhere. Python is an example of it. That's why it's a wonderful product. And then, of course, is OpenCV, Open Computer Vision. Uh, that is very very important in uh, in areas like uh, uh, machine learning, pattern recognition. Uh, computer uh, vision, gaming, uh, virtual reality, all of that you could get in that package of OpenCV. And then there's another one, natural language processing. So there are those. And so my, my suggestion is do not be afraid. You just go ahead and, and look at these open sources. Now, there is a foundation. You have to know basic uh, maybe C++ or Java. And that's basically all you need to, to do. And then you'd actually be able to understand them. So participate in that. In fact, a lot of, a lot of uh, students are, are doing, I mean, a lot of uh, people are doing that in, in, in India, in China, in various places without actually having to go through a formal curriculum uh, such, as, such as what I offered you. Now, as far as the, uh, yeah, so, uh, so it's actually doable. So those people among you, I, I really like this question, those people among you who might be interested, but maybe does not have the wherewithal to, uh, to enroll and invest on a two-year program, that would be certainly the start. And I think you can actually do quite well if you take advantage of all of these open source uh, software that's available for, for everybody. Thank you very much for that. Very profound answer. So we would like to thank our speakers, Director Antonio Edward B. Padre, the OIC Director, the ICT, Mr. Vince Timpongo, VP for Site Acquisition and Management Globe, Attorney Roy B. Ibai, VP and Head of Regulatory Affairs, Smart Communications, Do uh, Dr. Romel E. Gomez, Professor from University of Maryland, for the interesting and lively discussion. Indeed, Philippines is doing its best to face the challenges of growing into digital transformation. Our speakers have clearly identified key insights and factors that we need to understand to fully embrace a digitally transformed Philippines. We are guided with the directions to the chief framework from the MDP with infrastructures our government plan to maximize the rollout of free Wi-Fi for all and looks forward to utilizing satellite technologies to reach far-flung areas that has no internet connectivity for the moment. Our telcos have elaborated the digital lifeline for every, for every Filipino, while on the other hand, raising the issues in Philippine policies concerning the fast and efficient build-up of structures to support the internet connection needs of every digitally transformed Philippines. Meanwhile, we are also reminded that we need to build up our human capital on the rising demands for skills as digital transformation is unfolding in this era of fire or the fourth industrial revolution. We would like to emphasize that clear policies, government support for building infrastructures, human capital and internet infrastructure go hand in hand if we are to succeed in our effort to be digitally transformed. May the learnings that we have today during the session instill in us the seed for our contribution to help our country be fully 
digitally transformed in our individual as well as corporate capacity. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, what's left for me to say is that in behalf of the ERDT steering committee and the rest of the ERDT community, I express my thanks to our great speakers today. It was really an afternoon well spent. And of course, to my very efficient partner, moderator, Dr. Vyantos. Everyone, everyone, thank you very much for participating, to, uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, good afternoon and uh, take care. Good afternoon, thank you. Thank you.